uh, we've been looking at the word Shema, okay, in the Hebrew, and how it's listen, it's obey, right? Um, it's that we don't just hear God, but we hear him, and then we act upon it. We do what he's asked us to do. And we looked at this two weeks ago now in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. And the Lord said to him, who made man's mouth or who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So we're not just talking about naturally here. We're also talking about the spiritual. And at the end of the age, the Lord, did he warn us there would be a deafening like we've never seen before. All right. In the world, we know, but in the body of Christ. And this is why we need to talk about these things. And we left off a couple weeks ago, and I'm jumping back in. I have to finish this point because I think we really need to understand this. And some of you might be saying, I've heard this, I don't believe this, I know this, but you need to understand it from the standpoint for your friends, people who have grown up in the church, even people you think maybe are mature Christians, all right? This is the reality of the situation at the end of the age. If they do not believe this, deception will come in. Paul warned us that the, in Romans 9, 10, 11, but all throughout the scriptures in the end of the age, there would be, we know, a great delusion. And one of the greatest delusions that has existed since Abraham made a covenant with the Lord is Israel is not God's chosen people. All right? And we need to understand this. I am wholeheartedly convinced that if somebody does not receive Israel, they will not receive the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this bears it out. And so I want us all to be aware of this because you're going to have people you love, people you grew up in church with, people who you went to Bible schools with, people you sat next to you, and you're going to start talking to them, and they're going to have replacement theology in their heart, and they're going to start to slander the things that you're excited about. Because if you do not believe in the promises of Israel, you will not believe in the coming temple. You will not believe in the theocracy of Jesus ruling and reigning from Zion. You will not believe of his law going forth. You will throw all that stuff out and you will make it about the church. And a great delusion will actually come upon that person. And I think we need to understand this. And, and I know there's a lot of people that would say, oh, I know what re replacement theology is, but I am convinced every single one of us, even if you've grown up in a good evangelical, Protestant, charismatic, whatever you want to phrase at church, you have replacement theology in you somewhere. And God needs to weed it out of you. Now, you might be going through that process, or maybe you've come to a revelation on that process, but we've all heard it. Who here has ever been in a church and the pastor gets up? Maybe it was you, okay? And you got up and you read a scripture from Isaiah, which is about the literal ruling and reigning of Jesus from Jerusalem. And you said, and this is about the church, and my land, Jesus is going to come and rule and reign in. That's replacement theology. That is not the intent of the scripture. And so then we've taken something that is about a literal Israel, and we've made it about the church. We've made it allegorical and figurative. Can we glean things from those scriptures? Absolutely. Is Jesus Lord and head over the church? Amen. But is there a literal fulfillment of many of the scriptures regarding Israel? And we need to make sure we know that. So we were halfway through Romans chapter 11, and we're just going to finish this portion here. So we're going to pick it up 11 verse 12, and it says, Now if their transgression is riches for the world, he's talking about Israel, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their fulfillment be? Amen. What's he talking about? Paul is referencing all the prophets. And he's saying their rejection brought about, remember what it says in Isaiah, Galilee of the Gentiles has seen a great light. Who came? Jesus. And Paul quoted this in Romans here. And we know it was about the Jews in that time. But was it also about all of us, the Gentiles? The nation, seeing that great light and the gospel going forward. And because of their rejection of the Messiah, we know this, this salvation went out to all the nations. But what will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. So who was this written to specifically? Everyone take your finger and point it at yourself. Okay, if you're Jewish in this room, it's still written to you. But specifically, it's written to Gentiles. And I think we're all Gentiles in this room. So then, what is, if you know anything about the church, what has been blacklisted from being read? Romans 9, 10, 11. Yet if you go to every evangelical church, guess what their favorite book is? Romans 1 through 8 and 12 through. <laughs> that's, that's fine. We'll read all that. But we won't read 9, 10, and 11. Because it tells us very clearly what God's sovereign plan is. He continues on and he says, I'm speaking to you, our Gentiles, inasmuch then I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy, my fellow countrymen, and save some of them. Do we have that heart? We should have that heart, of course, towards the Jewish people. But also, do we want to see people come out of the false, we'll say, harlot church? And should we want to see some of our countrymen saved? Okay, people who are in deception. This is what Paul was, was obviously burdened with. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but? Come on, life from the dead. All right, so God handed them over, we're going to see for a time, but will he restore them? 
And will the Messiah come and will he rule and reign from his holy city, Jerusalem? And will Israel be given a new heart and will they be loyal to the Lord forevermore? That is his covenant he has made with them and it will happen. He continues on and he says, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if you, some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were, were grafted in, excuse me, among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. Now, these are famous verses. Actually, we've read these many times in this church, and you've heard them all the time. And we need to. Where do we come forth from? Israel. We come forth from the, com the, the promises, the covenants. Of course, it's from God. But salvation comes from the Jews. Do we have a Jewish Messiah? Do we have Jewish saints, sanctified ones that we look up to? And we want to become like them, right? We emulate them, as Paul says. And do we have a Hebrew Bible? Okay, yeah, and the New Testament was written in Greek, but who was it written by? The vast majority were Jews, Hebrews, okay? And all the covenants, the promises, the priesthood, this is what Paul says in the earlier uh, chapters, it belongs to them. And he says, it supports us. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. All right, now this is where it gets really real because you're saying, okay, Israel was broken off for a time. And because of that, has God been very gracious to the nations? And have we come in to his kingdom? And Israel, there were some that were broken off. Now, were there Jews who did believe in the Messiah? Come on, were there Jews? Is the whole Testament, New Testament written by Jews who believed in the Messiah? Yeah, okay, so we need to also remember that. But there were those who were in unbelief. They were broken off, right? But he then goes on to say, do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. What is Paul teaching us here? If you reject Israel, God will break you off. Is this a very serious message? And so if you are meeting Christians that say Israel is not the chosen people, God has rejected them, they are standing broken off from the tree. Now, can they be grafted in if they repent and be reconciled? But if they stay in that place, what does... Jesus, tell us what will happen to those branches that are cut off. They'll be burned. So somebody who claims to be a Christian, and we need to get this, because Jews, did the Jews who rejected Jesus, did they reject him and be like, now I'm done with Judaism, now I'm no longer a believer, I'm a full-out pagan? No, they didn't do that. They were deceived. They thought they were still on the tree, yet they were on the side broken off because they rejected the Messiah. Well, do we have a whole group in the church that has rejected Israel, and they still think they're connected to the root that supports them, but they're cut off. And the reason I'm so painstakingly going through this, and we're talking about Shema, he who has ears to hear. If you do not hear this message as a believer, you will be cut off from receiving the rest. And that should really put a godly fear, just as Paul is teaching us here, because the vast majority of the church believes Israel has been rejected. Israel is no longer God's chosen people. That they have been replaced by the church and you will find that all over the place. And I want you to have ears, guys, to hear it. Because there's good teachers, people that I would even listen to. And then all of a sudden, I'll hear something. I'll go, oh, I know where they're coming from in that. They don't believe that the literal Israel will rule and reign. And do we have those ears to hear that? Or do we say, well, they're a good teacher, and they've got 2 million people on YouTube, so they must be right. The more followers they probably have, the more wrong they probably are. Okay? We need to understand that. I'm not saying there's not big ministries that have people following them. But I don't know about you. The more views I see, it, it's usually not a good sign because they love the, the money of men. They love being viewed by men. That pharisaical heart starts to come in. So as we continue on here, it says, Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue, everyone say if. 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 That's, that's a contingency. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Now, I find these verses hilarious because do you know Calvin, where he formed some of his major doctrines for Calvinism, eternal security, which was based on Augustine and other things as well. But do you know what verses he used? Romans 9, 10, and 11. And he used it to argue that no matter what, if you believe in Jesus, you will never lose your salvation. What did Paul just go on to say in chapter 11? If. If you do not believe God's covenants, plans, obviously Israel, all these things, what will happen to you? Because of your unbelief, you will be cut off. You can lose your eternal salvation. 
You will still be eternal, but it will not be eternal in the kingdom of God. You will be eternally separated from the kingdom of God. These are very severe warnings from the Lord. And that's why these scriptures are very seldom read nowadays. And it says, they also, if they do not continue in their belief, who is they? Israel, the Jewish people, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and you were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So does God love the Jewish people? Are there evil Jews? Are there a lot of evil Gentiles? Do we all have to give an account to the Lord for what we've done in this age? Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. But has God made a, a covenant with Israel? And when they repent and when they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they see whom, whom they've pierced, and they mourn and they weep, and all the different houses by themselves, will they be reconciled? And what will happen? Life from the dead. Okay? And guys, it is not a full fulfillment of this, but the reality of Israel being born as a nation, that is a part of the life from the dead. That's the natural element. There has been no other nation in 2,000 years that has been exiled, spread all around the world, tried to be wiped out by multiple different empires and rulers, and yet they're back in the homeland that God made a covenant with them with. If people, if Christians reject that, they are on a very dangerous road. Okay, and we need to remind them of that in, the, in love. But if they're going to continue in that, what will happen? They will be cut off and their ears will go deaf and they will not be able to hear what the Lord is saying. So let's get a bit of prophecy here. Micah 7, 14 through 20. Again, if we believe what Paul taught us in Romans, this scripture is very easy to interpret. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession, which dwells by itself in the woodland. In the midst of the uh, fruitful field, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days when they came out of the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Nations will see and be ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth and their ears will be deaf. So we see right now when it comes to Israel in the world and in the church, is there a great deafening and blindness? And people do not want to receive it, and they hate the Jewish people. And what does that teach us? It's not natural, it's spiritual. Because they are the people of God. And that is the land that the Lord will come to. And as we see this here, as Jesus is returning, as a great deliverance happens, what will the nations who are here do? They will put their hands, right? And they will be blind and deaf, but they will be in amazement that Israel is the chief nations above all the nations. They will be gobsmacked because what will all the nations, what are they all doing right now? They are being gathered together to come against Israel. And they believe they will wipe them out. And it will become very close. But who will come and deliver them? Jesus will. And he will come and they will be gobsmacked to see that Israel is the chief, the head. He is ruling and reigning from these places. So this is why we need to understand this. And if we don't embrace this, there will be a deafening and a dumbness that comes over. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord, our God, they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before you. Who is like, uh, is, sorry, who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? This is not a scripture necessarily about us. Now, is it a spiritual principle? Does God forgive our iniquities? Does he pass over or cover us? Right? And that is true. But what is this scripture about? It's about Israel. It's about when they will come in. And when they come in, God will not hold their iniquities against them. And this is where we need to make sure our heart is right. Because who loves quoting the scriptures about how God doesn't remember our iniquities? How he cast them as far as the east is from the west. And if you start talking about the Jewish people and you say that, do you know how many Christians say, no, no, no. They don't deserve it. You've made God a liar. If you actually have that doctrine, they don't deserve it. You don't deserve it either. How come he doesn't just cut us off then? Right? It creates a very vindictive God. It is actually an assault. Uh, the way I always remember it and, and think about it is the parable that Jesus gave us with the man who was given one talent. And what did he do? He accuses the master. He has a judgment in his heart against the master. And if we have anything against God's people, who do we have a problem with? Yeah, the Jews, of course. But we have a problem with their maker. We have the problem with one who made a covenant with them. And he will what? Pass over the rebellious... And it says, uh, a remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever. Hallelujah. 
because his delight is unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread out our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham. Those are, again, just names of the fathers. This is Israel we're talking about here. Which you swore to the forefathers from the days of old. Can we get an amen? What does amen mean? We agree, we agree or so be it. Do you believe this is going to come to pass? This has not happened yet. This is future. This is God's plan for Israel. And if we believe the scriptures, we will love the truth and we will not be deceived. And this is where we're going to now shift in this message. All right. So as we've been talking about Shema, right, hear or listen, right, and then leads to obedience. Did Jesus say this a lot? Now, Jesus did not, he would have known Greek, right, the, the language of the time, but the common language was Aramaic or Hebrew. And when they were speaking scripturally or when they were in the tabernacle in the temple, specifically, they spoke Hebrew, okay? And when they were in the company of their fellow Jews, they usually spoke Hebrew. Aramaic was uh, the common language of the time, but they held to the tradition of their Hebrew faith and their Hebrew roots in a good way. I know there's a bad thing in that now. But in this here, Jesus, many times did he say, he who has ears, let him hear, right? Let him hear. But really, it means hear or listen. All right, so if we were listening to Jesus, what would he be saying? He, now, I'm not going to do all the Hebrew because I don't have it all memorized. He who has ears, Shema. When he said that in the hearing of all the Hebrews, what would have popped into their mind? specifically Deuteronomy 6, and so many other things. And now the Messiah is saying, Shema, Shema, listen to me. I am crying out, are you going to hear the words that I'm teaching you? And we know many times Jesus said they don't have ears. And he specifically, we read this a couple weeks ago, he spoke in parables because they could not receive it. All right, because of the blindness, the deafness, and hardness that had come on that generation. And are we dealing with that? We made a case for that two weeks ago at the end of the age. Luke chapter 11, verse 8, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? What is the faith? To hear the word of God, to hear the cry of the Messiah and obey, to give ear to the things that he is saying, but not only in ear only, but also in action. And Jesus, he is pleased with this. And this is the culmination, we'll say, of almost 6,000 years of man's history if we were to sum up in one word, what is man? Mankind apart from Jesus. Rebellious. We are rebellious. Okay? There's many other words we could put on it. There's many other things we could say. Of course, it's sin. It's all that. But we are a rebellious people. We know the angels themselves, that they rebel against the Lord. So what has the Lord been crying out from the beginning? Listen. All right, if you've ever had a rebellious child or your child's not listening to you, what do you want them to do? Listen, <laughs> you just want them to obey. You're like, come on, I'm trying to help you. I'm showing you the good things. I'm trying to lead you on the path because I've been down that path, son. I know where it goes and it doesn't end good. And they keep going their own way. But then they cop on and they come to their senses and they say, dad, you were right. What does that do to a parent's heart? Oh, <laughs> joy. That's right, joy. Because you're trying to save your child. You're trying to bring them into the path of righteousness. And maybe you walked in some of those unrighteous ways. You did some of those sins. And you're trying to rescue them from it. And when they listen, what happens? Joy comes over you. Peace comes over you. So it is the same thing from the Lord. What is he crying out as our father? Listen. Give an ear. Obey the things that I'm commanding you to do. And he's crying these things out. So we're going to do a contrast. I did this in Arklo a couple weeks ago. Actually, a couple months ago now. But I want to just look at really quick two voices, and we're going to sum this up leading into another voice. And so the first voice we hear, and I believe when Jesus is speaking, we are supposed to know this because Jesus referenced the Proverbs, and did he say, wisdom, she is vindicated by her children. So he was referencing the prophets. So when Jesus was saying, give an ear or hear, who else was crying out in the prophets? Sorry, who was crying out in Proverbs? Excuse me. It was wisdom. Wisdom cries out. Will you give me an ear? Will you listen to what I'm saying? And so in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20 through 33, it says, wisdom shouts in the streets. Now we're going to make a case for this. Do you know our God is shouting from the heavens? Okay, he is. And for those who will listen and obey, he will deliver them. But we are seeing at the end of the age, so many, they are turning their ears. They do not want, and we're going to go into that. She rises her voice in the public square at 
that the head of the noisy streets and cries out at the entrance of the gates of the city, she declares her sayings. So is God, now wisdom, of course, comes from the Lord, is the Lord crying out. And he's looking for us to give attention to him and obedience to him. But it's a very severe warning. Everyone wants wisdom, don't they? Right? Everyone's like, I want to be like Solomon. But do you know if you don't listen to wisdom, you will become like Solomon. That is the warning. If you get wisdom from the Lord, but you don't obey the wisdom that you've been given, you will become a Solomon. You will become full of, you will be puffed up to the millionth degree. And what will happen? That wisdom will actually become folly. It's not enough just to obtain the wisdom. What do you need to do? You need to act in it. You need to walk in it. You need to make it your life. And Solomon, if he learned and lived by the wisdom that was attained from the Lord, would he have married all the foreign women and brought in all the foreign gods? No, he would not have. So he he heard it, he knew it, but he didn't walk in it. Proverbs 1 verse, let's see, this is verse 21. How long, you naive one, All right, now, so other translations phrase it really bluntly there. They say simple ones. Some of the translations actually say stupid ones. Come on, sometimes do we need to hear it that bluntly? When we don't hear the voice of the Lord, what are we being? Stupid, okay? We are being naive. We are being simple. We, We are being in a very dangerous place. It says, will you love simplistic thinking? Oh, how long will scoffers delight themselves in scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Turn to my rebuke. Everyone remember that line. Okay, because we're going to see now this is not necessarily the same word we would use for repent. There's different ways we would use this. This one is this one is like a repent turn towards me. We're going to see there's another time where turning away is in the Greek. It's the word more apostasy. Okay, so there's turning to there's turning away. And so we see here what repent return to my rebuke. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my advice and did not want my rebuke. So what will wisdom come and do to you? Correct you. Who here loves to be corrected? Look at all those hands. When you are corrected by the scriptures, by the Holy Spirit, by a good person that loves Jesus, that is wisdom coming trying to save you. What is your instant, we'll say, reaction in that moment usually. Don't tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me? Well, I don't have to listen, but if we're telling somebody the words of Jesus, and we are both believers, who needs to abide by those words? Both parties. The party who's bringing the rebuke in love, but also the person who is receiving the rebuke. Will we receive rebukes? Will we receive correction? And this is a good test for us. Are we humble or are we proud? It continues on. It says, turn to my rebuke. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. Oh, we read that. Yep. Uh, And it says, yeah. And you neglected my advice and did not want my rebuke. I will also laugh at your disaster. I will mock when the dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your disaster comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Is that a very hard verse? Why? Because you're a fool. You did not heed the counsel of the Lord. So what has come upon you? Disaster. All right, and have we seen this throughout human history over and over and over again? And is it about to culminate in the day of the Lord? The most foolish thing that any human can do right now is not believe that Jesus is coming back. Not believe that he is the just judge of the earth because what will happen? They will be caught in his judgment. They will be caught in that day. And hallelujah, in that day there will be great salvation. But in the book of Revelation, are there many fools who will not turn away from their idolatry, their gold, their sorceries, all those things? And what do they do? It says they knew it was the God of heaven and they blaspheme him. Why? Because they did not heed his counsel and they became so hard and, and, and did not want to turn to the Lord, but they turn away from him. It continues on and it says here, they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. These verses are very important for us at the end of the age. And I've made this case a couple weeks ago because I think we always think somebody's always going to turn to Jesus. If I pray for him hard enough, if I give him the gospel enough, there are going to be people that will not turn. There are going to be people that no matter what, they they are sealed in their hatred. All right, their heart has become so calloused and hard, they do not want to turn to the Lord. And, And I've said it before, I know I'm the bearer of great news. This is not what everyone wants to hear, but this is the truth. And if we accept the truth, will we then have a soft heart to the Lord? Will we go on to overcome? And when they turn away from the Lord, who do we hand them over to? The Lord. 
But if we try to keep them on ourselves, it becomes a weight, it becomes a burden. And so the whole thing here is he's saying there will be those who hate knowledge. They actually do not want these things. And what happens? The Lord, he will not give attention to their cry anymore. It says, they did not accept my advice. They disdainfully rejected every rebuke from me. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way. And now the amazing thing here is, does God rebuke them? Come on, does God rebuke them? And as God rebukes them, what's the hope? That they would turn to him. That salvation would come, but it reaches a point where a son, over and over again, you rebuke, you rebuke, but you have to say, okay, that's it. I take my hands off. You do not want to change. You have chosen your course, and you let them go, and it has to be that way. And it continues on, and it says here, so they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and shall be filled with their own schemes. Do you think Paul had this in mind when he was talking about sowing and reaping? Right? And the reality of what we, what we grow, right? So it says, for the faithfulness of the naive will kill them. Faithlessness, excuse me, of the naive will kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever, what's that word? Listen. Guess what that word is in the Hebrew? Shema. <laughs> Whoever listens, whoever hears, whoever obeys to me will live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. I want to be that. So how do we get that? We need to listen to the voice of wisdom. We need to listen to God. We need to fear the Lord. We need to come into that place of honor and reverence for him. And that's what it said, right? They did not choose to fear the Lord. It doesn't say they don't know the Lord. They know him. They choose, I will not fear you, I will go my own way. And they are handed over. And verses like this I find are so integral for the times we live in. Because when we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it talks about a strong delusion coming upon the world like we've never seen before. Do you need to know these verses? That it, it wasn't just like God was like, all right, I choose this person, this person, this person. They're given over. These people, I like them. No, no, no. They've sowed a lifestyle of this. And this is what they want. And God says, Romans chapter 1, if you want it, it's yours. Is that what he just said? And if you want that, you will reap the fruit of what you sow. And I know these are hard things to hear, but we need to realize that. And it will help us embrace the days that we're living in. And then we say, God, you are just. Vengeance is yours. I leave it with you. And what happens? We turn towards the voice of the Lord. The others might be turning away, but we turn towards the voice. We listen to him. We obey him. And wherever they go, and guys, I think this is one of the biggest things we're going to be dealing with coming up. And, and I know I've taught this before, is the parable of the virgins. But the whole thing, they were all virgins. Okay, we have to understand that. They were all virgins. The five foolish ones, did they try to prevent the five wise ones from going into the wedding banquet? That means they were Christians. Christians, wherever they were, the Lord. It doesn't say, say they're thrown out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, by the way. They're caught outside in the dark. I find that interesting. I think that's a sign that there will be Christians who miss the rapture. They'll be caught in the day of the Lord, but what will happen to them? They will repent. They will be martyred, and they will be killed by the Antichrist, but they will come into the kingdom of God. All right? But they were not ready in that moment. But what do they try to do? They try to take the oil of the ones who were ready. So we need to realize these things and listen to the voice of the Lord. Mark chapter 4, 21 through 25. This is Jesus. And he was saying to them, A lamp is not brought... To be, put under a ba- bought, to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? It is not bought to be put on the lampstand. Uh, is it not bought, excuse me, to put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed. Nor has anything been secret but that which would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, what's he crying out? Shema. Okay? Now, as we continue on here, he then continues and as we read some of these things jesus is intending the hearer right to know of course deuteronomy chapter 6 many other places as well but he's intending them do you know the proverbs do you know the prophets do you know okay i'm not gonna have time to go into it all but isaiah there's an amazing portion in isaiah uh what is it 42 through 44 where it talks about the deafness that came upon them but as you read it it's not just about israel it's about the end of the age It's about the deafness and who is as deaf, who is as blind as my servant. And it's talking about the Messiah coming. And so in that, the reality that he is warning us of these things. And the Jews in that generation, they were supposed to know these scriptures. But they were deaf, they were dumb, they were blind. Their hearts were hard. They couldn't receive it, the vast majority of them. And the Lord is warning us again at the end of the age, it will be the same way. You could go. Has anyone ever went to tell somebody, you know they love Jesus, right? But you start talking about the coming of Jesus and they get angry. They don't want to hear it. Isn't that a little concerning? 
There's something that's not right there. I'm not saying they're not saved or where they're, and that's between them and the Lord. But if they continue on that path, is that a very dangerous path? It's very dangerous. Because what is our blessed hope? Come on, what are we longing for? His coming, that's right. His eternal reign. And if a believer does not have set that, have that set as their hope, there's something integrally wrong there. And now can they repent? Come on. Maybe you came to know the Lord. Maybe you weren't looking for Jesus to come. Maybe that's you today. Can you repent of that? Can you long for the Messiah, the bridegroom, the things that have been prophesied to come to pass? And God will stir that longing in your heart, that bridal love in your heart for him. And you will have great hope because it is our great hope, guys. So anyway, Jesus then continues and said, he was saying to them, take care that you listen to. Take care of what you listen to, excuse me. So he's talking about Shema. He's saying he who has an ear. And then what does he go on to say? Be very careful what's going into your ear. All right? And, and I find it amazing. Has anyone else find it amazing the last couple of years, uh, the manifestations of things that we've seen, right? And it's not about technology. It's not about the medical field. It's not about anything. But it is a physical outward manifestation of what's going on spiritually. Did everyone literally cover their mouths for years? And were afraid to speak, afraid to go places, okay? And literally shut up and stop preaching the gospel. Many Christians did. Now, hallelujah, we've come out on the other side. Many people have repented and come out and went on boldly professing the gospel. And may we learn from these things. You walk around the street, what will you see most people have on their heads? Earbuds and headphones. Nobody listens anymore. You'll be walking down the street, you go, hello. Like, again, I'm not saying it's spiritual. I'm saying there's a natural manifestation of what's going on. And if you were to know, some of you mature ones in this room, you don't understand how evil and wicked this generation is and what they're listening to, right? The Beatles were evil, okay? I have to say that bluntly. They were evil. They were very wicked, okay? And they led a whole generation, many others as well, into complete apostasy, hating God, because they hate God. So as they hated God and taught all that stuff, did it get into your generation? If you look back at the 60s in history, how was it? It was the sexual revolution, it's what brought about the depravity that now there were many other things that contributed as well. But it's gotten us to the point that we're in now, okay? And embracing drugs, embracing. Now, nowadays, drugs aren't even a real thing anymore, are they? Unless there's a big bust and now we let people off and people are doing horrible, horrible things to their body and there's no law to enforce it, okay? This is the reality of what we're dealing with. Now, in this, what's the point? The things nowadays that kids are listening to, it is not music. It is literally doctrines of demons, Okay, the podcast they are listening to, podcasts that, like the, the teachings or series that they would listen to, they are listening to such depraved things, things that are apostate and, and bringing literal demons whispering in their ear. Okay, and this is what's on their head 24 7. And so, if that's getting into you all the time, what's going to happen? It's going to come out of you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you wonder why murder is on the rise. You wonder why theft, drugs, everything that we see in our society, why? Because this is what people are feeding themselves. What's another one of this? Now we're getting to the point where literally you have no eyesight anymore. Who here can live a day without your phone? <laughs> I'm being silly, but I'm seeing serious. And now we've got a whole society that's going to go into the metaverse, that's going to go into virtual reality and literally just check out. Okay? These are spiritual things that are manifesting naturally. All right? They are not just natural things. It's showing the inside condition of humanity. And so Jesus, what does he say? Take care of what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And more will be given uh, you besides. And whoever has to more, right? Him more shall be given. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks, right, he has, shall be taken away from him. I've got a different translation in my head, sorry. I did this one just because of the way it says, take uh, care that you listen to. And so this is the point. God is very concerned with what is going into our ears. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, the rock, his work is perfect, and for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness without iniquity, just and upright is he. Are we in that camp? Is that our God? So if that's our God, what are we going to take care of? What we're listening to, what our eyes are seeing, what we're going into. And, and I know we've talked about this in the past. The reality is the Western church, have we really dropped the ball on this? We, we dumb it down. And we say, it's okay. It's just a little bit. What does the Bible say? A little bit of leaven. Leaven's the whole lump. 
And guys, we're reaching times. What did the Lord tell us? It's always been this way. But you shall be holy as I am holy. But that holiness process, is it becoming uh, uh, very distinct? It's very clear. Is God separating it out the righteous from the wicked? And when you stand up for the things of God now, what's going to happen? There used to be people that would say, well, you know what? That's good for you, but I don't agree with you. They're going to scream at you. They're going to argue with you. They're going to say, who are you Tell me what to do? I want nothing to do with your God because your God, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And we are seeing this more and more and more. But are we going to take care of what we are listening to or are we going to obey the voice of the Lord? Matthew 7, we know it, right? Jesus told us, therefore, he who hears. If we were listening to it in Hebrew, what would he have said? Shema, he who hears these words of mine and acts in them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and slammed against the house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act in them, he will be like a foolish man who's built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and its fall was great. Now I want you to interpret these passages in an eschatological, we'll say, an end times view. We have a whole church now for decades has, that has not been listening to the words of Jesus. We need to, we need, again, I know it's hard to hear. We have hundreds of thousands, I'm sorry, hundreds of millions, if not billions of Christians around the world who do not listen to the words of Jesus. So what is going to happen to them? There will be a great fall. There will be a storm. Is the storm coming, guys? All right, did we not see it in COVID? How many, they went through all the Western nations and did all the statistics, and on the low, 10% of the church never returned. What did that show us? They were never truly following Jesus to begin with. They might have started well, but then what happened? They fell away. The world got in. They started to go into the world, and it got to the point where, you know what? It's easier to stay home. You know what? Oh, well, it's just a little bit of drugs. It's just a little bit of drink. Well, I don't need Jesus' Holy Spirit because this will come in that place and satisfy me. This is what we've seen. Now, hallelujah, are we all still here today? And may we endure. And may we what? Be the wise one who hears his words and puts them into practice. Why? Because the storm's going to come, the wind's going to blow, but we will not fall because we are built upon the rock. Amen. That's what we read right in Deuteronomy 32. He is the rock. Luke chapter 6, we see the same thing again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? That's, that's a hard verse. It's the same thing, basically, what we get in Matthew 6. It talks about a foundation and building and digging down and building upon the foundation. But the whole thing, if you're not built upon the rock, what will happen? You will fall. If you build upon the rock, you will have security when the, the gale comes, the wind, the storms, all those things, right? But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And is that a very hard verse? And the Lord is challenging all of us. He says, do we call him master, master? If he is our master, what will we do? We will obey him. Now, is anyone in this room perfect by our, what we call that word perfect? No. And is God very gracious? So we always need to bring that in. Now, is that an excuse to practice sin? By no means. But do we all fall short of the glory of God? Do we all sin? And what are you supposed to do? Repent. Run to the cross. And if you aren't doing that, what does it mean? God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We are pride, proudful, excuse me, if we do not run to his cross, if we do not cast our, our cares, anxieties, our worries, our sin, all those things upon Jesus, that is what we are called to do. But it's another thing to say, Lord, Lord, I'm a Christian, I love you, Jesus, and not obey his commands consistently and make that your lifestyle. And so we need to make sure if we call him Lord, do we do what he says? Both PJ and Rachel pointed this out a couple months ago, and I'm just going to point it out again. This is to the Hebrews. And Paul was talking to a group of people, right? It was written to the Hebrews who had the faith, had the teachings, had all the upbringing, right? And now Gentiles are coming in, and Gentiles, did they have any of that stuff? Did they go to yeshiva school? That's where they were trained in Torah. Did Gentiles do that? No, no, no. They were pagans. They were going into, you know, the temple of Hercules and sacrificing to pagan gods. And now they've come into the faith. And the Hebrews now, for hundreds and thousands of years, have had the faith. And he is now rebuking the Hebrews. And concerning him, we have much to say. I believe he's talking about Jesus here. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, different ones have different translations there. But this word, what it really means, it can mean sluggish, slothful, 
But it's really, it's that whole thing. They literally become sick and they can't do it. There's something wrong that's coming out of them, okay? They are not walking in what God has commanded them. Why? Because their ears are sickly. Their ears can't hear what Paul is saying, what he's writing in the letter here. And he can't go as deep because he knows if he teaches them what's going to happen, they can't comprehend it. They can't receive it. There's something wrong with their hearing. Because he continues and he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elemental principles and oracles of God, and have come to need milk and not solid food. So is there a time for milk, church? Amen. Okay, Peter talks about that too. But when you've been a believer long enough, are you supposed to move on in the natural? You, do you grow up? Who here likes drinking milk when, for dinner? And that's all you get. Only milk. No spuds. No nice steak. No cheese or anything. Just, just milk. What would happen to you as a grown adult? Come on. You'd, yeah, you wouldn't grow up. You'd become mal malnourished. You wouldn't be able to process real food. Your stomach would actually start to have problems. So we go down all the, the natural route, right? But the reality is, as you grow up, what are you supposed to go on to? Solid food and on to meat, on to mature things. And what Paul was telling them here, this is again to believers. And this is again to us at the end of the age. Believers. There are believers that can't go on to the meat. Why? Because they have to know why Jesus died on the cross again. You should know that. <laughs> We shouldn't have to keep going over that. If you need to keep going over that, what does it mean? There's some sin somewhere. I'm going to say just sin. Because at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, it actually is talking about unbelief. And there's some unbelief somewhere. If you have to keep going over the same thing over and over again, you're not believing it. All right, so the simplest application of this, all of us have done this in this room. We repent of a sin. We really did mean it. We felt God's grace in that moment. We then leave that place and the enemy is the accuser of the brethren, and what's he do? He come accuses you in that sin. You have two choices in that moment. Go in the name of Jesus, Satan. He forgave me on the cross. I am no longer walking in that, and we proclaim the truth, and we go on and do what is right. Have we done that? Amen. I've done that, and I'm sure many of you have done that. There's the second option. Maybe he didn't forgive me. You start to give in to that voice. Do you know a sin that you previously committed and repented of and the enemy comes and accuses you of that and you don't walk in that freedom? Do you know it can turn into sin again? I'm not saying you'll do that same sin. I'm saying it'll turn into unbelief. Because if we then go on and say, well, yeah, I guess Jesus didn't forgive me for that. I think his cross, yeah, I don't know if it can, it can help me in this area. That's unbelief. That's sin. And the devil comes into that place and we've all heard that nagging voice. And then we all start to doubt, and we can go into that place. And what do we need to do? Get behind me, Satan. No, no, no. That was the finished work of Christ on the cross. I repented. I felt his grace. His Holy Spirit came and ministered to me in that place. Go in Jesus' name. Because if we entertain that thing, what happens? We then start to go down that rabbit hole, and then you could come up and say, well, I don't know. Did Jesus really forgive me on the cross? That's the elemental things. Because it shows that the enemy has gotten in and got a foothold there. And what can happen? You can stop hearing. For everyone who partakes of only milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. And because of practice, they have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So are we going to have our senses trained? Are we going to grow and are we going to go past the milk? And are we going to go on to the solid food? And do you know, just as the Hebrews... We're intended to go on to be teachers. Do you know all of you in this room should be able to teach? You all sit here and go, what? <laughs> I'm not talking about you have to take this mic and do a big Sunday presentation. I'm talking about from the standpoint, you, if you have received this message, should you be able to teach it to somebody else? Your common salvation, right, as James said, should you be able to tell somebody else how to be saved? How to come in to know Jesus and repent of their sins and walk in righteousness and be delivered from the schemes of the devil? All of you should be able to do that. And do we need to grow in our faith then? And if that freaks you out, me saying that, well, let's grow today. What did the disciples say when they heard, heard hard things from Jesus? Lord, increase my faith. Lord, increase my faith. That if I'm caught in a situation that's very hard for me, Lord, increase my faith. May I have boldness to tell them the truth. All right, so we're going here again really quick. I know we keep going back to this passage, but we have to just break it down one more time. Not one more time. We're going to keep going back to it until Jesus comes. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12, I want to look at this in the context, again, of Shema. 
hearing the voice of God. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, the rapture, the resurrection of the dead, we ask you not to be shaken or troubled in mind, either by spirit or word or letter. What's he telling us? You're going to be hearing things. Things are going to come and they're going to speak to you. And he says it's going to be man, it's going to be spirits, it's going to be even the evil one himself. He will come and try to disturb you concerning what? The coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him. And I have seen this. I've been around long enough now in the charismatic church uh, most of my life seeing good people back in the, the, you know, the 80s and 90s who longed for the coming of Jesus, talked about the coming of Jesus, were majorly impacted by, we'd say, renewers or revivals that have turned away from the coming of Jesus, that no longer talk about the coming of Jesus. That instead, they turn, we're going to see aside, to fables and myths because they want their own desires, not God's desires. So these things, they come, and what are they going to do? They're going to speak to us. They're going to try to get our ear. As if from us, though the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord, has come, let no one deceive you by any means. The day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he sits, excuse me, as God in the temple of God, showing himself to that he is God. All right. So we've broken this down over and over again. So Paul is reminding us, the day of the Lord, our gathering together to be with him, the rapture, the resurrection, it cannot happen until what? The Antichrist, that's right. And before that, what needs to happen? The apostasy. Now, if you've heard this, I really quickly have to break this down. There is a false teaching going out there, and the good people believe it. Pre-tribbers take this verse, and what they've started to teach is this is not a falling away, but it's a falling up. Has anyone heard this before? They are arguing that this verse is the rapture. All right? And it takes a whole lot of manipulating of the word, because the word there is apostasio apostasy. What does apostasy mean? I don't know about you. I've never heard the word apostasy being used in a sentence for calling up to be with the Lord. This is how they've twisted it. All right. Now, again, there's good people that believe that people that are longing for the coming of Jesus, but because they don't believe some of the other prophecies, they've got a uh, PJ always said it this way. He always talked about, you know, taking a, you know, a square peg and trying to fit it in a round hole. Or right, taking a puzzle piece and putting it in the wrong spot. And you, you like that puzzle piece so much. What could you do? Ah, oh, now it fits. It doesn't work that way. Because the picture's going to be, something's going to be off. So we can't force things. So pre-tribbers, they believe that the rapture can happen at any moment. Okay? We believe very clearly what is Paul teaching us here. The rapture cannot happen until what? The apostasy comes first. The man of sin, the man of perdition, is revealed, and he proclaims himself to be God. Where? In the temple. Okay. Is the temple built? Is the temple about to be built? Come on, let's get an amen there. Come on, hallelujah. That is prophecy. Come, Lord Jesus. So in this here, his temple will be built. All these things will happen, and it shows God's sovereign plan. So do we have ears to hear that? Can we hear? Because, guys, if you love Jesus, what does your heart say? I want Jesus to come tomorrow. <laughs> and is that the right heart? Yesterday, yeah. <laughs> is that the right heart? But what does the scripture say? Certain things on that day, yeah, amen. The certain things must happen first. The Jews in the first century, they, were they longing for the Messiah? They were. But were there certain things that had to happen first? And then later on, did all the apostles write about the certain things that had to take place so then the Messiah could come at the, what does it say? Appointed time. So these are the signs for the appointed time of his return. He then continues on. He says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? All right, so again, think of this in the context of the message I'm bringing here. Shema. They heard it. They were told it. They were taught it. So could you be in a good church? Could you be in this church? There's many others as well. And you're hearing about the coming of the Lord. But are you really hearing it is the question. Or are we taking it and we're saying, okay, that's interesting. Oh, well, maybe. Or do we have reservations? I'm talking about the scriptures. I'm not talking about speculation here. I'm talking about the verse we just read. Certain things must take place. Do we take it to core? Do we take it to heart? And do we say, Lord, I believe these things. Lord, I might not see it all. I might not understand it all. Maybe you're in Bible school right now. And, and you know, 90%, maybe 99% of what's being said, you're like, what's going on? Because you've never heard it before. 
All right? And that's, that's not an insult. That's just the reality. We're all growing. We're all maturing. Maybe you've never studied eschatology, and now you're, the day of the Lord, it's everywhere. <laughs> and you're overwhelmed by it. That's okay. But if that 1% is going in, then it comes 5%, 10%, and you grow when you mature. And by faith, you believe it. God will write it on you. God will get it in you, right? So then as it continues on here, it says, And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. All right, for avoiding the rabbit hole. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Is it already at work, church? Yep. And it's been increasing. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Can we get an amen? All right. So there is a restraining right now, and it will be taken out of the way. And I think very clearly this is Michael the archangel. Come to Bible school, we'll, we'll make the case for that. The coming of the lawless one is in accordance, right, in the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders or false wonders, and with uh, unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. Do we love the truth? When you hear Jesus' word, are you in love with them? Okay? Doesn't mean they're not hard. Doesn't mean there's not things that challenge us and convict us. If you've been married long enough, your, your spouse, your husband or wife has had to say something hard to you, has had to rebuke you. And in the moment, you didn't want to hear it. And you wanted to say you were right. And if you're a godly person, you went away and you humbled yourself and you went back and said, honey, you're right. <laughs> Man or woman. And you've had to have those tough conversations because one was being emotional. I'm not saying women here. I'm saying men or women. Do you know men can be emotional? Do you know we can get angry and just be hot-headed and do what we want to do and be stubborn? But we, in that moment, one is being emotional, one is being spiritual. And the spiritual one gives good godly counsel, and the emotional one is off the handle, and then they come back and they say, you were right in that moment. Forgive me. And they do what is godly. All right? So in this here, do we love Jesus like that? In the moment, we might be emotional, and Jesus is like, you need to, I don't want to do that. It's not fair. And this person, oh, Jesus, forgive me. Lord, those thoughts were not your ways, they were my ways. And I humble myself, and I know your way is right. And I choose to listen and obey, and I know it will produce good fruit in my life. And we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why? Because he will exalt us. He will lift us up at the proper time. All right, so then they didn't receive a love of the truth so as to be saved, right? And for this reason, God will send a strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I chose the King James here, New King James, because it puts in some of the articles that some of the other translations don't, all right? And it talks about uh, be troubled in your mind. My, my translation, the American Standard I usually read, doesn't phrase it that way. It says, and I think it talks about, you know, in your, your uh, it's going out of my head right now. Uh, but anyway, it's just phrased a little bit more bluntly here, and I think it gets the point across. And so in this, what is Jesus speaking here through Paul? What is the Holy Spirit saying? These things must come to pass. But at the end of the age, there will be many who what? Are deceived. Why? They did not love the truth. All right? On the screen, those are words. But what are they? They are the truth. And this is the dividing line. We are seeing now like we've never seen before. And, and what does it come down to? Do you love the word of God? And there are many people that like the church, they like the Holy Spirit, they like the concept of Jesus, they like the concept of, you know, fellowship and having a meal, and oh, I need prayer because my leg hurts. But when you come and start to read the Bible, the truth, what do they say? I don't want to hear that. No, 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 no. I like God, but, but that's, that's not what I want to listen to. Because what does the Word of God do? It is sharp. Yeah, it convicts, it cuts it pierces right through us. Who's felt that before? All right? And it shows us we are not God. It shows us we can be wrong. It sh keeps us in that place of humility. And it shows us God's master plan. And who here has ever had a plan that later on you came to realize wasn't God's plan? It was your plan. And then you read the Bible. Maybe the Lord comes and ministers to you, the Holy Spirit. Maybe you get a prophetic word and you realize, no, oh, that was my plan. And you put 20 years into that plan. What do you got to do then? Kick yourself. <laughs> yeah, kick, your, kick yourself, yeah. Are you willing to let go of your 20-year plan? Maybe you've lived your entire life without bowing a knee to Jesus, and you know he's Lord, 
But you say, I want it my way. And it takes 60, 70, 80, 90 years. Are you willing at that point to bow your knee and acknowledge my entire life, was, my way was wrong. Your way is right. Does it mean everything you did in your, wrong, your, your life that it was wrong, God can't redeem? By no means. He's very gracious. But does it take humility? That I did it my way, but Lord, now I choose to do it your way. And as we do that, what is that? That's that Shema that's hearing, listening, and leading to obedience. So at the end of the age, what does the Lord tell us? There will be a powerful delusion. There will be many who do not hear. 2 Thessalonians continues on, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which uh, he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. What does that mean? Don't move. Hold fast. Stand fast, right? And hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle, by the letters. So the things that you've heard, what is he now challenging them to do? Walk in them. Hold fast to them. All right? So as you have heard, and I know all of us have, not just in this church, many other places. We've heard good ministries, good ministers, people who have ministered to us, people who have spoken the truth to us. What do you need to do? You need to stand fast. You need to hold firm. All right? So there's been good guys who have come way before me, John Wesley, even Derek Prince, not that long ago. And did they teach a, a revelation from the Lord maybe about the coming of Jesus? Amen. Or about, okay, Derek Prince, demonic deliverance. All right? And was there great things that they brought to the body of Christ? And it was the truth, and it was backed by Scripture. And if somebody else comes along and says, well, yeah, I know, but that guy was 40 years, 60, 100 years ago. We've got a new way to drive out demons. It's in the name of apostle so-and-so. That's how we drive out demons. No, 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 no. You need to hold fast to the traditions you were taught. And by a good teacher, not a heretic. Not somebody who's trying to lead you into apostasy. He continues on. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Come for your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Is that awesome? That's the ministry of our God. That as we stand forth in his truth, what's he going to do? He's going to comfort us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to establish us to do the work that he's called us to do until he takes us home. Maybe give an ear. So we all know this one, 2 Timothy, verse 4. Sorry, chapter 4. Now, in chapter 3, Paul talks about Timothy. Uh, he's reminding him, in the latter times, there will be very evil times, okay? Horrible things will happen. And then he goes on to talk about you hold fast to the scriptures. Hold fast to the things that you were taught by your grandmother and your mother. And he's talking about the Hebrew scriptures, right? And then he charges Timothy to walk. Uh, we heard it during communion. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold. So Paul is continuing his theme to Timothy here, and he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, keep that verse, I have it highlighted in mind when we get to another verse, preach the word, be ready, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with the complete patience and teaching. So what is the word of God used for? It's, he says the same exact thing at the end of chapter 3. For re re uh, reproving, right? Rebuking and exhortation. It's to correct us, right? It's to exhort us. It's to lift us up. It's to bring in godly counsel into a situation where we don't know what to do. So if we don't know it, if we don't read it, we will not have that in our life. He continues on. Of course, what does it need to be brought with? Patience. It needs to be brought in, in love. Uh, I think uh, in the old King James, it talks about, you know, forbearance or bearing with, right? For the time is coming when people will not endure what? Sound teaching. Now, that word is a very interesting word because if you look at it in the Greek, it can be sound, that's fine, but it can also be translated healthy. They will no longer endure healthy teaching. They won't want what is good for them. They'll want something else. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So you won't want, we could again say sound teaching, that's fine, but I think it's interesting, it can be translated healthy. They won't want healthy teaching. Their ears, something is wrong with them. And what do they want? They, so they want someone who will come and tickle their ears, so to speak, itch their ears. Somebody who will give them what they want. 
All right? It's just like if you, again, the simplest analogy is a child. I go to my child and I try to get them to eat, you know, a nice salad and I put ice cream next to it. What are they going to do? Ice cream. They're not going to want the salad. They're going to say, why do I have to eat this? Right? And then in this, we know that it's healthy, good for you, has some chicken, has some things in it. We'll give them. And then you say, okay, then you can have the ice cream. But no, they've kicked the cream. They want the ice cream. So what's the point? Paul is telling Timothy here that we will see what people who will come, they no longer want healthy teaching. They no longer want sound doctrine. They want stuff that will come and they will accumulate what their ears want to hear. What will come and soothe their sickness and disease in their ear. Okay? They will find somebody who will tell them what they want to hear. So guess what, guys? Those things that are in our heart that aren't submitted to the Lord, something's going to come in and try to appeal to it. Who's ever experienced it? I'll be the first to put up my hand. When I realize something and I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, Lord, I got to deal with that. That week, something will come. That moment, something will come and try to appeal to that. Maybe it's something as simple as, you know what? Your neighbor was a jerk. <laughs> and in that moment, you said, you know what? I'm not praying for them. They don't deserve God's forgiveness. What voice is going to come and tickle you in your ear? Come on, what voice is going to come? You don't need to forgive them. That's right. They deserve that judgment. And then you go on YouTube, and what's going to pop up? Oh, there'll be a teaching for that, and it'll be Christian, and it'll be somebody in a big church, and they'll tell you, oh, that's right, because those people, slave rep reparations, they did this to us, so you know what? We don't need to forgive them. You know it's all around the world right now? That unforgiveness and bitterness in the church is being accepted, and it's appalling. It continues on here, and what does it say? Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers that suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. What is the truth? The Bible, that's right, the Word of God. And people, they want to go away from the Bible. They want to wander into what? Myths. They want to wander into fairy tale. They want to into what? Something their ears want to hear. Because the Bible is sharp. And it cuts through. And people are looking for something that will tickle them, right? Give them what they want. And it says, as for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering. Do the work as evangelist, as an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. At the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. May we be like Paul, finishing and keeping the faith, not having our ears tickled. All right, so I'm not, I'm not going to rant here. I'm just going to give a, an example of this. I'm not against YouTube. I'm not against other ministries, but you need to understand the vast majority of Christian ministries on YouTube or God TV or any of that stuff, they are false ministries. They are not looking to edify you. They are looking to deceive you. And usually they're after your money, okay? Now, I think I have a right to say this as a minister of the gospel, but also the reality of coming from America and dealing with many of these ministries. This is the reality of it. And I know this has been a very sore issue here in Ireland because has there been, have there been lots of ministries that have done this? and come and rob the Irish people. Did the Catholic Church do it as well? And the Protestant Church and everything under the sun. Doesn't mean we throw out the biblical narrative. But when you go on YouTube and you find a teaching and you listen to it, what do you need to know? You need to know the truth. You need to know the Word of God. You need to make sure that person, that teacher, is teaching the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God and you start listening to that stuff, what's going to happen? It's going to tickle you. All right? And what's very interesting, do you know the things, okay, so let's say you want to look up a topic. You look up that topic. What are you going to find? Who is, okay, I've got to just tell you all this. You need to understand this. Those algorithms in YouTube and Google, who is giving you all of that? Everyone's been freaking out about AI and all this stuff. It's AI. They are not going to pump the good ministries to the top. They're going to pump the false ministries. They're going to pump the ones with the most views because why? YouTube wants to make money off of you. They want to make money off the gospel. Google suppresses the truth. It hates the truth. So what's the first thing that's going to come up into the algorithms? False teaching. So if you're basing your searches off stuff that you found on YouTube and on, on Google and all these different things, you are not going to find true Christianity. You're going to find a false version of Christianity. I have to tell you this at the end of the age because we are dealing with this like we never have before. So what do you need to combat that? You need to know the Bible. You personally, I'm not talking about through Banner of Love, through a YouTube series, through anything else. Who needs to know the Bible? Everyone. And how will you know the Bible? 
by reading it yourself, not being taught by someone else. Is it good to have teachers? Absolutely. But do you need to know it for yourself? And anything I say from this pulpit, do I tell you to go home and look it up? And check me and make sure it's in the word of God and I'm not a madman. Because if you just follow a man, you follow somebody you like, they will lead you astray eventually. We need to follow Jesus and Jesus alone. Rant over. All right, so then we're almost done here. I fought the race, right? I fought the good fight. He's finished his race. He continues on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 8. And I chose the King James Version here because it gets it closer to the original. Henceforth... There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day. What's that day? The day of the Lord, the day of the kingdom, the day we are all longing for, right? And not to me only, but all who, who have also that love his appearing. All the new translations say loved. What does loved mean? Past tense. So it takes the verse and makes it not about the future, loving his appearing. And you can look it up in the Greek. It can actually even be translated, those who are longing for his appearing. Loved makes it about the cross. Is that good? That's good. That's a great translation too, but that's not what the verse is saying. Because at the beginning, what's he saying? In the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, by the appearing of his kingdom, and then he says, I have run the race, I've run, I've finished, right? And now there is a crown laid up for me, and also those who have love who love, who are longing for his appearing. It's not a past tense, it's a future tense. It's a hope that one day, if we hold fast to the teachings, hold fast to the truth, will we receive a crown like Paul? Will we receive a reward? Will we be welcome into the kingdom of God, right? All right, so I just have to get one more point out. I'm just going to go five more minutes here. We started a bit late. In Hebrews chapter 12, 25 through 29, Paul here is writing about the contrast of uh, Sinai and Zion. And he goes on to then quote a prophet, Haggai here. And it says, see to it that you not refuse him who is speaking. For they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth. Much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. So who is speaking? The creator, our God. He is speaking. All right, did he speak from the mountain at Sinai? Did he speak the Ten Commandments over the, the tribes of Israel? He did, absolutely. And then they went on to rebel, and he talks about all this. And he's saying, okay, they did that. Now you stand by your faith, right? We read that before. And so I have this picture here. This is a picture not too long ago. This was the biggest gathering of Satanists all time. Well, modern day, we'll say. In America, this was in Boston. Uh, and we did a little bit on this on one of the Thursdays. But what they did, they came together and they chanted, Hail Satan, Hail Satan, and they ripped up Bibles. Okay? Now, we could say, yeah, these are Satanists. Yeah, they are. But you can go into the street, and do you know what you'll find? If you handed somebody who was really opposed to the Word of God a Bible, what would they do with it? They would tear it up. Maybe some of you who are street evangelists have encountered this. I've encountered this personally. I've handed people uh, the Word of God, and I've seen them tear it up, spit on it, throw it in a bin. All right, now it's just a book. We need to understand this. Your Bibles are not magic. Okay? If they fall apart because you read them so much, is that a good thing? And you need to get a new one? Good. But your Bible is not magic. Okay? It is paper. It is words. It is the content that is important. So if your Bible gets burned, if somebody ripped up your Bible, somebody threw out your Bible, is that okay? If you had your Bible for 40 years and you got all your notes in it and Jesus told you to give your Bible to somebody on the street, would you do it? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay? Because can he give you a new one? And maybe he wants to give you a whole new, obviously, time of studying the Word and writing new notes, and you grow in your relationship with the Lord. So the point is, it is the Word of God, but it is just, again, a book. It is pages. It is paper. Remember Mike years ago in one of the youth groups? He took a Bible, and he went, whoosh, and he chucked it across the room, and everyone went, <gasps> okay? Apostasy, yeah. <laughs> we should not mistreat them if we can, obviously, but the point is, the content. Do we know the content? Do we love the content? Why is this woman ripping up a Bible? She hates the truth. She hates the truth. Are there many, unfortunately, out there like that, that hates the truth? And this is, the, the again, challenge to us at the NVH. Are we going to hear him who is speaking and love the truth? And it says here, and his voice shook the earth then, and now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Amen. 
Therefore, since we've received a kingdom which can not be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire, taking us back to the mountain. And our God, is he coming in fire? And he will consume his adversaries if they do not repent. But do we love his truth? Are we listening to when he's speaking? Do we love his word that when we hear it, when we hear the voice, come on, who here hears the voice of the Holy Spirit? And he says, don't do that. Are you listening? We all make mistakes. I'm not speaking, you know, you have to do everything right and perfect or you're going to hell. We all make mistakes, but do we repent from those mistakes? Do we, are we soft to his voice? Are we attentive to his cry? And what happens? Then those sins, they don't happen as often. Those things that we used to do, as Paul said, as were some of you, we no longer do because we're strengthened and we walk by his spirit and we don't carry out the desires of our flesh. All right, I just want to read Haggai here and then we're going to end with this. For this is what the Lord of armies says. Once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. So who's saying it? The Lord. Is the day of the Lord coming? Did the writer of Hebrews explain it to us in a, in a greater detail, in a sense, interpreting the prophet and saying, that which is natural is going to be shaken. The heavens and the earth, the things that are created. Angels themselves, were they created? Come on, yeah, they were. They're going to be shaken too. But in this, the things that cannot be shaken, what can't be shaken? The unshakable kingdom, the kingdom of God. So he says here, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill this house with glory. So this brings me full circle, all the way back to what we started with in Romans chapter 11. Do we believe Israel? Because if you do, you'll believe this prophecy. That God is bringing about his day, shaking everything, and what's he going to do? He's going to fill his temple with glory. Because who's going to come into the temple? Come on, who's going to? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus will rule and reign from that temple. Okay, he will come and be king of kings and lord of lords from his holy habitation in Jerusalem. It says, the Lord of armies, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of armies. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of armies. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of armies. Now, I chose, this was actually the new American standard, the newest translation, because it has the Lord of armies. And I think that's, that's the best translate, Yahweh Zabayot. And so in this, what's the point? Over and over again, what's he talk about? I am coming to shake everything to restore the house of Israel to bring about all the things that have been promised. And what will happen? This house will be filled with glory way more than we've seen in the latter times. Now, in this generation for them, they were thinking of Solomon. And the glory of Solomon's temple was it beautiful. There was nothing like it, I think, that's ever been built on this earth. But this temple that will come, okay, not necessarily the one that's going to be built for the Antichrist, but the one when the Messiah comes and Yeshua, Joshua, Zechariah actually prophesies about it. He will come and build his temple and the nations will stream to it. He will fill that house with his glory. Why? Because he will be there. The Messiah himself will be the, what we call, we heard this morning, the Holy of Holies. The cool thing in Ezekiel's temple, did you know there's no curtain? There's no bread. There's no lampstand. There's no incense. Why? You have direct access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the High Priest. There is no, no separation for in that time period during the millennial reign. Awesome stuff. All right, verse 21, jump down now. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and say, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the nations and the kingdom and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and their horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. Do we believe it? Okay, this is again, do you love the truth? This is the truth. The nations will be gathered, God will render judgment, and many will fight against the Lord in the day of the Lord. And he will bring vengeance. On that day, declares the Lord of armies, I will make you Zerubbabel, son of Shiltel, uh, my servant, declares the Lord. I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of armies. Now, Zerubbabel, God did exalt him his time, but this is an amazing prophecy because does anyone know Zerubbabel is in a certain line? He is in the line of Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy that Zerubbabel, obviously one who will come forth from his lineage, from David ultimately, will become what? The one who is in that place of power and authority and be the signet ring of the Father here on the earth, ruling and reigning from his holy habitation in Jerusalem. So I know I went over a couple things over and over again. The reason I'm doing it is on purpose. Do you believe it? 
Do you believe the truth? Have you made it your home that no matter what this world says, no matter what another Christian may say, no matter what a doctrine or somebody who's really famous or when we see the apostasy coming closer and closer, are we going to hold fast to the truth? Are we not going to be shaken? We heard it this morning uh, from Joan there in Timothy. Timothy, Paul said it over and over again, guard the doctrine. Keep the doctrine. And what's the doctrine? The faith. It is the word of God. Do we love his word? Let's stand up. Thank you, Lord. All right. So I didn't get as far as I wanted to, but I have another week. <laughs> and remember how we started with wisdom. We're going to look at the counterpart of wisdom next week just for a moment. And I'll leave you with some great hope because I know these messages, they can be heavy looking at the apostasy, the wickedness, the evil we're dealing with. But we need to also remember Shema. We're going to talk about this next week. Do you know that, yes, we pray to God. Amen? Amen. And we need to listen to him, and he cries out to us. But do you know you can cry out to God? Do you know in Exodus 2, 24, it says, So God heard their groanings. Do you know what that word is in Hebrew? Shema. God is attentive to our cries. And we're going to look at that next week and how we endure at the end of the age and all the things that we're going through. Because it says in the scriptures, God is attentive to the cries of the righteous. He hears us. And so just as we shema, we hear, we listen, and obey, does God hear and listen, and can he even turn towards us? Are you, uh, for those who were here last week, did Rachel not talk about that? She talked about Moses, and she talked about Abraham, and how God, does he hear us? And does he then turn towards us, and he listens, and he is very kind to us? So Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is attentive to our cries. And Lord, as we look at the things that are going to happen at the end of the age and the itching ears, the reality of wickedness, Lord, and people accumulating teachers that will tell them what they want to hear, and they will turn aside to ungodly lusts. They will go after myths, Lord. We pray today that that would not be anyone here. Lord, that we would love the truth. And even if it is offensive, even if it's things we say, well, I don't want to do that, I want to do it my way, we would love you so we would submit to your word. And Lord, just as you tell us, those who love you, keep your commandments. You say, you are crying out, Father. We know you are. Jesus, you are crying out. Shema, listen, hear, hear my words. Come into my rest. Come into my house. Father, we just pray right now that we would be attentive to your cry. And as we are attentive, we would listen and obey the voice of our, our God. And we thank you, Lord, as we read that when we do obey you, like we read in Proverbs, Lord, you say that we will be protected, that we will be watched over. You will strengthen us, Lord God, so we bless your holy name. And Lord, we ask for wisdom in the times that we live in. Seek wisdom. She is crying out, Lord. We ask for it, Lord. And may we not just receive a nice teaching, a nice wisdom, something that gives us, oh, I understand that now. But Lord, we pray for the faith that we might act upon it. And as we do, Lord, we thank you. It'll bring about salvation for our souls, but also for our hearers and those around us. So we just bless your name and we thank you, Jesus. And we exalt you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. And we just thank you, Father. You are coming to Jerusalem. You will rule and reign from your holy city. And Lord, may proclaim the truth and anything that would try to stop us from believing and receiving these things may it fall down in the mighty name of Jesus and may we receive the love of the truth of God in Jesus name amen